Okay, I think we'll declare at uh, 1015 and begin uh, the lecture on Hayek and Friedman. Uh, this is a lecture uh, that I draw largely from a contribution to a forthcoming volume uh, called the uh, Elgar Companion to Hayek in Economics. Uh, although there are seeds of this lecture also in my book in Time and Money. Uh, so Hayek and Friedman are the featured economists, but as typical in macroeconomic matters, Keynes is right in the middle of it, okay? And so I want to start by uh, a very summary comparison of Keynes, Friedman, and Hayek, uh, and show you that in, in some ways, Friedman is more like Keynes, in other ways, uh, he's more like Hayek, okay? So let's look at this. It, uh, it, looking at uh, Keynes, we say that, we see that he theorizes at a high level of aggregation, well, it certainly does. So he argued that market economies perform perversely especially the market mechanisms that are supposed to bring saving and investment into balance with one another. Seeing unemployment and resource idleness as the norm, Keynes calls for counter-cyclical fiscal and monetary policies, and ultimately for a comprehensive socialization of investment. That quoted phrase is drawn from his Swan Song chapter, chapter 24, uh, in the general theory. Uh, now, Let's compare that with uh, Friedman. And the point I want to make uh, primarily is that Friedman is theorizing at a still higher level of aggregation. This, this sort of takes him a distance away from uh, Hayek. Uh, the equation of exchange that we'll get into uh, shortly, most of you are familiar with it, MV equal PQ, which is uh, says essentially the amount bought equals the amount sold. It's a, tautology, but a very useful one, as Friedman demonstrates. It makes use of the all-inclusive output variable, Q, putting into eclipse the issue of the allocation of resources between current consumption and investment for the future. In other words, the issues that both Keynes and Hayek grappled with are simply out of sight uh, in, Keynes, in the Friedman's theory because of his level of aggregation. Although Friedman is very much a classical liberal and believes, as you know, that markets work. Uh, and so he sees no problem emerging from the market itself. And so the, there's a change in focus here. He focuses on the relationship between government controlled money supply and the overall price level. Uh, now, let's compare Hayek, and we see that he's a, an in betweener in some ways. Uh, between Keynes and Friedman. Capital-based macroeconomics is distinguished by its propitious disaggregation. I voiced that on students so they have to look up the word propitious. Well-chosen disaggregation, which brings into view both the problem of intertemporal resource allocation and a potential for a market solution, right? Keynes brought into view the problem, but no scope for a solution and Friedman hid both the problem and the solution. <laughs> uh, so Hayek showed that coordination of saving and investment decisions could be achieved by market-governed movements in interest rates. He also recognized that this aspect of the market economy is especially vulnerable to the manipulation of interest rates by the central bank, okay? So we, we've got uh, Friedman and Hayek as cohorts is in their support of liberalism, generally, but we've got Keynes right between them in the sense of uh, level of aggregation and, and ability to deal with the issues uh, at hand here. Now, uh, the subtitle of this talk is How Methods Shape Substance. I just listened to Professor Long's uh, lecture and uh, think that mine, at least in the beginning, can dovetail with it fairly substantially, but then we head directly into macro, as you might uh, expect. Uh, contrasting methods, and here I'm going to take my 
cue from uh, Alan Melcher, who is a monetarist uh, and who is a Keynes scholar. He's written a book on Keynes. And here's what he says about methods. Uh, first, Keynes. Uh, Keynes was the type of theorist who developed his theory after he had developed a sense of relative magnitudes and of the size and frequency of changes in these magnitudes. All right? uh, he concentrated on those magnitudes that changed the most, often assuming that others remain fixed for the relevant period. So Keynes didn't hesitate to assume a fixed structure of production, uh, thinking or hoping it would stay fixed during the period over which he was analyzing movements in uh, animal spirits and that sort of thing. All right? So you get the impression here, he's just looking around and seeing what hits him in the face. He wants to sort of hit you in the face, magnitude of movements, variation of different magnitudes. That's what he's going to theorize about. Uh, when Melcher says this, he doesn't say it in a critical sort of way. He just says, that's, that's the kind of economist he was. Well, guess what? Friedman says, I believe that Keynes' theory is the right kind of theory. Right? So here, Friedman is a Keynesian in this sense. In its simplicity, its concentration on a few key magnitudes, and what makes them key? Well, they flop around a lot. You know, they, they have a lot of fluctuation. And potential fruitfulness. And where's the potential fruit? Well, it's ready-made for econometric studies. Okay, if you've taken a course in econometrics, you realize that you, you need the econometric equation, and then you need some variables that flop around a lot. Okay, otherwise you're not going to be able to get uh, correlations. Uh, Friedman claimed famously back in the late 60s that we're all Keynesians now. The first time I came in contact with this Friedman quote, I thought, no, I'm sure... I'm sure he doesn't mean that he's in favor of stimulus packages and credit expansion for getting the economy going and that sort of thing. Felt like I knew Friedman's stuff well enough to know he didn't mean that. He was accused of meaning that. In fact, in a Time Magazine article, uh, he explained how he'd been misinterpreted. He didn't mean that. Well, at least that's what some of us we're pretty sure of, but what did he mean? And he explained in the article that we all use the Keynesian language and, and apparatus. And at that time, the Keynesian language and apparatus was something that uh, goes by the name of ISLM analysis, the big multi-quadrant diagrams that uh, show the Keynesian magnitudes uh, moving around as they do. Uh, later, in 1999, he claimed that uh, force-fitting his own theory in terms of those Keynesian magnitudes, that particular apparatus, was the worst mistake of his career. And yet, he never says what he should have done. You know, what sort of framework, theoretical framework, did he have in mind instead? So monetarism got presented back then and still yet in terms of the Keynesian framework. He wrote a two-page or two-issue article uh, in the JPE where he set out uh, the monitor's view using the Keynesian apparatus. You'll notice, though, when he says we all, that's a little bit too all-inclusive, isn't it? We all, that is, Keynesians and monitors, not we all, including Hayek, because <laughs> Hayek didn't use uh, ISLM analysis. Okay. Now, Hayek, and I get this from a Pure Theory of Capital. Hayek says, the role of the economist, well, actually, this is my uh, paraphrasing, the role of the economist, Hayek points out in the Pure Theory of Capital, 1941, is precisely to identify the features of the market process that are hidden from the untrained eye. And if you want to underline the differences in your notes, it's... Keynes hit you in the face flopping around variables versus Hayek 
hidden from the untrained eye. That's why an economist becomes trained, <laughs> so he can see what's hidden from the untrained eye. Uh, the uh, local news uh, anchor can tell you what's flopping around. Okay. For Hayek, then, again, uh, this is paraphrased from my contribution to the Elgar Companion. Uh, for Hayek, then, the cause and effect relationship between central bank policy during the boom and the subsequent economic downturn have first order claims on our attention despite the more salient co-movements in macroeconomic magnitudes that characterize the post-crisis spiraling down into deep depression, right? Yes, yes, we know about how an economy can spiral down into depression uh, with both output falling and money supply falling and so on. But what we're more interested in is how did this all get started? You know, what happened during the pre crisis period uh, to trigger that kind of a, a response. Okay. This is out of his uh, Nobel talk, and you can see how it relates to what we've just presented. Uh, Hayek says, there may well exist better scientific evidence, and scientific is in sort of scare quotes or sneer quotes, that is empirically demonstrated regularities among key macroeconomic magnitudes for a false theory, which will be accepted because it is more scientific than for a valid explanation, which is rejected because there is no significant quantitative evidence for it. I emphasize that quantitative because I'll show later that maybe there's some qualitative evidence uh, for it that the Austrians <laughs> are privy to, but the uh, monitors tend to overlook or downplay. Now, here I want to contrast uh, Friedman and Hayek in terms uh, of their focus and precisely the, the different questions they ask in any uh, field, and certainly in economics, certainly in macroeconomics, when you see economists coming up with different answers, the first thing to suspect is maybe they're asking different questions and they each have answers to their own questions, but then it's important to look at the questions and say, are those really the questions we most need answered? So let's take a look at it, and I'll try to drive the point home here. Here's, here's Keynes. Keynes attributes the downturn itself to psychological factors affecting the investment community rather than movements in the interest rate. And here is the direct quote. He says, and this is in his chapter on notes on the trade cycle, chapter 22. He says, I suggest a more typical and often predominant explanation of the crisis is a sudden collapse in the marginal efficiency of capital. And if you know the, your Keynes, I mean, MEC, the marginal efficiency of capital is just, is just investment demand, demand, the demand for loanable funds to undertake investment uh, purposes. In other words, all of a sudden, the business community cools its heels, loses its nerves, turns pessimistic, this is all psychological uh, talk, and uh, therefore qu quits investing. Right? That's, that's the cause of the downturn, but it's almost a throat-clearing remark uh, in Keynes because what he's more concerned with is not what caused the initial downturn. His main focus is on the dynamics of the subsequent spiral downwards. That's the multiplier and all that stuff and on the policies aimed at reversing the spiral's direction, that stimulus packages, okay, and all that. So he's, he tells his story of business cycles peak to peak. In other words, he starts with the downturn. Okay, we got a downturn, now what's gonna happen? One of the things you can look for when you hear Keynesian talks or you hear reading, they'll talk about how a bad situation gets worse. Keynesian theory is largely about how a bad situation gets worse. And it makes you wonder, well, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. And we started in the middle of our story, why did it turn bad in the first place? And of course, Keynes' answer is the psychological uh, aspects of things. Now, this is still Friedman. Or this is Friedman. Friedman's dismissive of the whole issue 
of the cause of the initial downturn in 29, referring to it as, and I'm a collector of these phrases, if you, if you come across others, let me know, referring to the downturn as an ordinary, run-of-the-mill, routine, garden-variety recession. <laughs> he doesn't use them all at once, you know. I mean, it's just one, one at a time. But to say it's a garden-variety recession really is to say that uh, the, it's not anything that would attract the economist's attention. You don't need to explain a garden-variety recession because it's just a garden-variety recession. Okay? But once you get the garden-variety recession, then some bad things can happen and make it uh, uh, much worse. So again, his focus is also the same as Keynes in that sense. And so his focus on policy is on policy blunders that occurred on the heels of the downturn and on the correlation between the decrease in the money supply and the decrease in real GDP. And those are the two things that hit you in the face as a, as a big changes. So he's uh, Keynesian certainly in that respect. And a, a typical way that uh, Hayek would, or that Friedman would conclude a lecture or conclude an article. Let's see, do I have it here? Did I pass it up? Let me go back for just a minute. Okay. I missed one little quip there, but that's okay. Uh, so Hayek then focuses on the policy-infected aspects of the boom and their implications for the boom sustainability. So he's asking a different question. What was it going on before you got that garden variety recession to cause the garden variety recession, which then got turned into a monumental uh, Great Depression? The post-bust reallocation of labor and capital takes time but the particular dimensions of the depression, its length and depth, are to be explained largely in terms of the policy perversities in each particular cyclical episode. In other words, the Austrian theory of the business cycle is not a theory of the depth and length of historical business cycles. It doesn't explain the depth and length of the Great Depression or the depth and length of our current downturn. It explains why there was a downturn and how that subjected the economy to still other forces that made things worse, many of those forces uh, political. Uh, it's almost as if I'm calling into question here something that Austrians often say, and that is the bigger the boom, the bigger the bust. Is that true? Can we claim that? And I would say yes, but only in a limited sense. Think of it this way. Mainstream economists, when they talk about unemployment, they divide it into categories. You know about this. You've studied this stuff. There's frictional unemployment. There's structural unemployment. And we've named those to get them out of our way so that we can analyze the third category, which is cyclical unemployment. That is, it's not structural. It's cyclical. All right? Well, in the Austrian view, what counts as cyclical unemployment is a particular kind of structural unemployment. In other words, it's intertemporal structure. That's what's out of whack, right? And so at, uh, at the point of crisis, the crisis is all about how out of whack the economy is because of structural maladjustments. And if you focus on that, in other words, the cyclical component of structural unemployment, then it's true that the bigger the boom, the bigger the bust. You've got more structural unemployment. It's going to take longer to uh, right the economy uh, with a larger amount of structural unemployment. But it's not true, bigger the boom, the bigger the bust. Beyond that, it's certainly not true with the Great Depression because that particular amount of uh, malinvestment and dislocation and so on was swamped, I'm talking about just in historical terms, it was swamped by perverse policies of all sorts, including tariff policies, including trying to prop up prices in terms of burning potatoes and burning or killing pigs and plowing under cotton, in terms of make work projects, in terms of monetary policy and all the rest. So that's a particular uh, historical episode that we have to look at at piecemeal to see what's going on. 
Okay, Friedman's monetarism. Now, see, in, in this lecture, I don't have a bunch of interlocking graphs because I'm just working with monetarism, which is largely MV equal PQ. Uh, and his application of that equation of exchange is based on his empirical finding that the velocity of money is constant or nearly so, tolerably slow, actually has an upward trend to it, but that can be taken into account. It's very stable uh, uh, in uh, Friedman's view, at least in normal times. Uh, and that's what gives him an anchor to work with the rest of the equation. And by the way, there was a long period uh, at the University of Chicago when many, many dissertations written under Friedman were about the stability of the velocity of money, right? And, and looking at different countries and different time periods and monetary data and uh, output data and finding if uh, there was any evidence that velocity was changing much. And a successful dis dip dissertation was one that showed pretty conclusively that velocity is not changing much, uh, which seems like kind of a limp conclusion, but it's a critical conclusion. And it's what allowed uh, Friedman to show such a strong relationship between the money supply and the price level, because he knew, it, as many economists knew at the time, that output grows pretty... Uh, not very steeply, output grows at, you know, 3% a year, something like that, maybe four. Uh, so if you got that nailed down and you know the velocity's not changing much, then you get a pretty hardcore relationship between money supply and the price level. So output, that's Q, grows slowly, which means uh, the price level moves with the money supply. <clears throat> So I'll put a, a bar over velocity, uh, and I'll show output increasing, but only slightly, uh, and then uh, money supply increasing fairly dramatically. Well, can we predict then the price level goes up too? Right, and that's you know a, a hat tip to Friedman for this. Uh, the equation of exchange has been known for many, many decades before that, uh, but Friedman, almost single-handedly, was, was able to wrench it back into existence and uh, beat some Keynesians over the head with it, right? And he was fairly successful at doing that, and, and uh, our hats are off to him uh, for that. Uh, there was a little problem here, though. We've got, uh, yeah, the money supply is what's causing the prices to go up. He identified that as the uh, the cause on the one hand, the effect on the other, on the basis of uh, the lags. But he also measured the lag in his, his uh, phrase repeatedly used was a long and variable lag. And if you had to pin him down, he'd say, oh, 18 to 30 months. And I want you to make a note about that 18 to 30 months. It'll come back uh, to us in the later part of the lecture. And that was a little bit of a thorn in his side. He, he wasn't quite comfortable with that long a lag. Why should it be so long? Why should it be so variable? And even in one of the last things he wrote about uh, the issue, this was in Monetary Mischief, a book uh, in the 90s. I can't remember the publication date. But he, he listed this as one of the problems remaining to be solved. How, how do we get a better handle on that lag? And wh why is it so long? Why would it take 18 to 30 months? or more money in the economy to bid prices up. It just seems like it would happen sooner than that, especially if you're working with MV equal PQ. Okay, well, we'll come back to that. Inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Uh, other people knew that uh, earlier, uh, in, including David Hume. <laughs> but uh, it's direct quote from Friedman and he made that statement sing, okay? He, he drove the point home. Uh, and again, he beat the Keynesians over the head with it. And he even influenced uh, economics in the policy realm, in the, in the Reagan administration and in the Thatcher administration. Uh, 
turn the tide on the issue. And uh, the tide is an apt metaphor because the tide comes in and the tide goes out. <laughs> okay. So he turned the tide, but the tide didn't stay turned. But at least you have to credit him for turning it uh, when he did. Uh, Hayek, for all of his debating with Keynes, uh, unfortunately didn't turn the tide in quite that way. So Friedman's monetary rule, well, it's just a rule to avoid uh, inflation. Uh, if, uh, if quantity is growing at a slow rate, well, so should the money supply. Uh, actually, a little faster if you want to take account in the slight rise in velocity, but I'm ignoring that. Uh, and if you do it right, then you get a constant price level, a stable price level. Uh, these days, stable price level goes by the name of 2% inflation. Uh, but here I'm just taking constant price level, stable price level, just uh, <clears throat> as an illustration of, of uh, the equation of exchange and the quantity theory of money. Uh, now, a problem that you might see with that, now that you know some of the Austrian theory, is, is to think, well, now, wait a minute. When you increase the money supply, that stuff comes through credit markets and it puts downward pressure on interest rates. What about that? So we don't want to forget uh, our old friend, the loanable funds market. Okay, then and money comes out through credit markets, it increases the supply of loanable funds. Can we, yeah, we did have, uh, and uh, it gives you that decrease in the interest rate, which causes some problem. This is not any part whatsoever of uh, Friedman's theory, and later we'll see why but uh, it's just out of play, which is what leaves that long lag as a mystery, I will argue. Okay, let me see. Now, Friedman declares the 1920s as the golden years of the Federal Reserve. So he's, he's on a par with Keynes here, that, uh, that neither Keynes nor Friedman saw any problem during the 20s. It was only when we bumped into that garden variety recession that the problem started. So Friedman is with Keynes here. Golden years of the Federal Reserve, he ignores interest rates during the 20s because they didn't change much. In other words, when, when then he hits you in the face, changes. How much would they have had to change? You know, the, the interest rate st stays within a fairly small band, maybe it jumped up to 50% or so that, that would have gone into their econometric equations, but it didn't change much. And more on this later, because it turns out, it, historically it's actually true that during the 20s there wasn't much of a change in interest rates. But with Hayek's methodology, uh, he's able to tease out the problem in any case. For Friedman though, they just don't pass the Keynes criteria. Mm -hmm. the, I asked the burning question here, what if those interest rates should have changed but weren't allowed to? They should have changed but weren't allowed to. Uh, didn't breakthroughs in technology increase the demand for loanable funds and put upward pressure on interest rates? Yeah, any historian knows that in the 1920s, uh, that there was tremendous increase in technological innovation uh, from mass producing automobiles uh, to electrical appliance to processed food to chemicals of all sorts. There was, there was tremendous investment opportunities and plenty of entrepreneurs who wanted to take advantage of those and therefore made for an increase in the demand for loanable funds, okay? That would put upward pressure on interest rates, isn't that right? In fact, Hayek talked about that uh, in prices and production, <laughs> and he called it an interest rate break, B-R-A-K-E. In other words, as the interest rate goes up, it limits, it limits uh, the extent to which the entrepreneurs can take advantage of these technological innovations because they're aimed at 
future output. And consumers want some current output too, thank you very much, all right? So the, a rise in the interest rate would be just a normal market condition. Now, it turns out that the interest rates weren't allowed to rise because the central bank was accommodating, accommodating the increase in the demand for loanable funds with an increased supply, and therefore putting downward pressure on interest rate with the net result that the interest rate didn't change. This is the hidden forces to, you know, the, the untrained eye has to see these hidden forces, and this, is, this would be Hayek's view. Federal Reserve, guided by the real bills doctrine, met each increase in the demand for credit with an increase in supply, thus keeping the rate uh, from rising. So seeing no change in interest rates, Friedman dismissed interest rates as a potential independent variable in his econometric equation. Well, that's sort of hardwired into his methodology, uh, isn't it? Any of you who have taken econometric scores, how many have taken econometric scores? Okay, a bunch of you. Uh, you know that if, uh, if your independent variable doesn't change, you're in trouble. <laughs> it's it's got to change to explain anything. If it doesn't change, then out with it. You know, it's not going to, it's not going to help you. Uh, and it's true historically, it didn't change. In fact, as I'll, I'll point out later, but I'll mention it here too, because it's relevant, is that when I had some correspondence uh, with Friedman over an uh, article of his and a comment of mine in the journals, uh, he, he told me that uh, I should not be paying that much attention to interest rates because they didn't change. And he even attached a photocopy of a time series of interest rates. He says, look at the 20s, the interest rates aren't changing. It's so much for interest rates. So that certainly was his view about interest rates. So seeing no change in interest rates when they should change, should have risen, because of the technological advances, Hayek was able to identify some critical market forces hidden from the untrained eye. That's a huge difference in methodology. So a query here, uh, at which view, Friedman's or Hayek is more firmly anchored in the empirical, that is, historical circumstances of the 20s? Austrians get a bad rap by saying they don't like empiricism. They just don't like Plunky empiricism. Plunky is a Rothbardian term, by the way. They don't like Plunky imperialism, uh, empiricism. They want a broad-based empiricism that includes a historical understanding of the period and what was going on at the time. The Austrians were being a little more empirical, I think, than the monetarists. Uh, and I put in these slides just to show you a, stark difference between the dot-com boom in this respect and the housing boom. It sort of rings true when you see what's going on. With the dot-com episode, like the 1920s, you had lots of opportunities because people want to borrow lots of money. It was a digital res revolution, all right? And so what would happen initially uh, is that the demand for loanable funds would rise. Okay, so the demand for loanable funds shifts rightwards. And the Fed should have allowed it to shift rightwards. That's how the market works. That's what brings forth the additional saving. You can see that additional savings there in the horizontal arrow. But the government steps in, the Fed steps in, and puts a lid on that interest rate, keeps it from rising, all right? And as a result, you kill off the, sa the extra savings that would have been available, and you replace it with money created by the Federal Reserve. All right, so here's another example uh, of uh, a boom where the increase in credit rides piggyback on another shift, namely the shift in the demand for loanable funds. Now, let's contrast that and we had low interest rates during that period, but not all that low. They didn't change much, just like in the 20s. But if you look at the boom bust in the housing episode, you get a different story. Because what was driving that boom uh, was not 
technological innovation so much, although there was some during the period, but uh, more, more predominantly, it was policies by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. They were subsidizing lending by eliminating the risk from 30-year mortgages. So that subsidy is sort of a subsidy to saving, okay? In other words, more people could borrow more money, so there's an increase in the supply of saving uh, because Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac was siphoning off the risk associated with all that lending. That put downward pressure on interest rates. The Fed steps in and lowers the interest rates still further. And why'd they do that? Well, partly they were trying to get the economy to recover from the dot-com bust, and partly they were trying to keep resources from leaving sectors that were not housing. In other words, all the sectors that weren't building houses would have to pay higher interest given so much of the available funds went into housing. So the interest rate was lowered still further. And that's why during that episode, you got incredibly low interest rates, all right? That's what that says. And if you want to look at the Fed funds rate during both those periods, uh, it looks like that. Uh, and it, it shows the period during the dot-com boom when interest rates were so-called too low for too long. Uh, and the reason they were too low for too long was partly because of that effect of, Freddie, of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And of course, after the bust and lower still, we're down to zero and with no sight, you know, no change in sight. Okay. Friedman's uh, idea of monetary contraction uh, is the same thing. It's just the money supply going down now instead of up. And so if, if there's a reduction in the money supply uh, and prices are sticky downwards, all that's necessary actually is that uh, prices don't immediately adjust to the new equilibrium. Then we get a lower money supply, and consequently, guess what? A lower real GDP. There it is, okay? Uh, so evidence shows that between October 1929 and March of 1933, decreasing M was the essential primary dominant cause of the decrease in Q in output. The way Friedman would conclude this, this is, this is sort of paraphrase the way Friedman used to write and talk. The correlation between movements in the money supply and movements in total output leaves no doubt about the central issue. Okay, the central issue being one that you can uh, deal with with the econometrics. Now, to drive the point home, it hasn't already been driven home. I want to spend a couple of minutes on the case of the cabbage-eating Mississippi monster. Have you heard about this? It goes like this. Suppose that in late October of 1929, a thousand-pound monster descended on Mississippi soil. It spent the next three and a half years eating all the cabbages and, and quite a few rabbits between Tupelo and Pascagoula. Okay. By early March of 33, the monster weighed 4,000 pounds. Two investigators are sent to Mississippi to handle, get a handle on the situation. One's from Vienna, the other was from Chicago. <laughs> you see this coming? <laughs> the Viennese and Investigator asked, where in the world did this hideous thing come from? Okay. Then after further study, discovers that it was that the monster was the unintended consequences of some ill-conceived government-sponsored bionics project. Case closed. We got that one figured out. The Chicago economist shows up, shoves the Austrian aside, and says, Never mind, never mind how this thing got here. The real question is, how did it grow from 1,000 pounds to 4,000 pounds? 
How did an ordinary run-of-the-mill garden variety monster quadruple in weight in 40 months? Okay. Chicago's answer, of course, is it was all those cabbages. He couldn't get good data on the rabbits. <laughs> so the correlation between cabbage consumption and weight leaves little doubt about the central issue. Okay. That's Hayek and Friedman in a cabbage patch, I guess. I don't know. So query here. Do we suspect that the data availability is what led Chicago to his conclusion? And the lack of hard data pertaining to the monster's origin caused him to be dismissive of the questions about where the thing came from. So these and related suspicions are what underlie the message in Hayek's Nobel address, The Pretense of Knowledge. All right. Now let's see where we go. I'm going to zip through some things here because I want to get some other things. But uh, yeah, you've seen this. Inflation is always an everywhere monetary phenomenon. But boy, that hinges critically on velocity actually being constant or stable, predictable. Okay, and it turns out that that's what did monetarism in this form in. That's what did it in. Uh, prices move with the money supply. Yeah, if V is constant, and so. Let's look at uh, first the inflation rate, and it looks like this. You get it on there, there it is. The money supply has a much stronger upturn in the recent years that seems not to be mimicked in the actual inflation rate. So is the equation of exchange wrong? Well, it's not wrong, it's just that uh, velocity has become unstable. Let's look at velocity. If you look at uh, velocity just up through into the 80s, about 82, it looks like that, okay? Uh, which is not exactly constant, but it's stable, it's predictable, it rises at a fairly slow rate. I mean, the, the scale exaggerates the rate, but it rises at a rate that can be taken into account with the equation of exchange. But if you look at velocity beyond that, if I can get it, there it is, uh, it goes wild. All right, so starting in 82, if you want a particular date, uh, the economy went wild. Uh, we can explain why, as I will. The velocity of money became unstable after 1980. Friedman's policy rule lost its velocity anchor the Federal Reserve abandoned the money supply targeting in favor of interest rate targeting. Didn't do any good to target the money supply because the velocity didn't change, or the velocity was unstable. And we can look at a plot of velocity. There's M2, another version of it, very unstable. Let me just mention the, the reason it became unstable was because of a so-called deregulation act in 82. It was really re-regulation, but they called it deregulation, where a certain requirement was eliminated called regulation Q. It's not Q as in quantity. It's just a, the, the regulation after P. Well, it's not P for price. It's just in the alphabet, okay? The Qth regulation. And the Qth regulation um, kept banks from paying interest on checking accounts. And it, it kept banks from allowing people to write checks on savings accounts. So it made a, gave us a crisp definition of money, namely M1. Okay? Uh, that was eliminated, so it blurred the distinction. And uh, nobody knew just where to draw the line on money. We'll see that shortly. The other thing that went wild, and you've seen these graphs before with, uh, with Bob Murphy, okay. excess reserves, demand deposits, the money multiplier, all these things went wild and just made controlling the money supply for the business of stabilizing the economy uh, impossible. Uh, 
irony of monetarism, this is relevant to Regulation Q, uh, the monetary rule that allows the economy to perform at its laissez-faire best, according to Friedman, presupposes a critical piece of intervention. That's the I irony. You have to have that one piece of intervention, Regulation Q, that makes the money supply operationally definable. But after 82, uh, you got Greenspan saying things like this. We don't know what money is anymore. <laughs> uh, he, actually, uh, he actually said that in sort of a forlorn tone when testifying before the Joint Economic Committee. We don't know what money is anymore. And it got popularized by Jay Leno, who used it on, in, his, uh, in his monologue. He quoted Greenspan. He says, you know, I don't know who should be running the Fed, but it should be somebody who knows what money is, you know. I mean, you didn't know what money is anymore. So that explains why they switched to uh, interest rate targeting at that period. They didn't know what money was anymore. Okay, we got time to do this and maybe one other thing here. Friedman's plucking model. How many have heard of Friedman's plucking model? Some people, some people have. It's not very well known. Uh, this is, this is uh, something that Friedman invented back in the 60s, but brought it out again in the 90s. Uh, and uh, the occasion was that in 92, that was his 80th birthday, he was invited to a monetary panel to present a paper. Well, he hadn't written on money in years. And so he, he dredged up a, a section of an old report in progress from the early 60s and introduced what he called was the plucking model. The plucking model is, is sort of stylistically empiri empirical. And it goes like this. He says, we can imagine a, a, a a growing economy with no cyclical problems at all. And you can see the upward growth there. He referred to it as an incline plane, an incline plane. So imagine this incline plane sloped like that to represent, you know, healthy growth. But if, he said if you look at the actual track of the economy, it, it has lapses from that. It's as if it gets plucked down. So he says, imagine a string. Where did he come up with this metaphor? I don't know. A string glued to the bottom of the incline plane, but at various points and to various extents, the string gets plucked down. Now, it's not like a guitar string where it snaps back, or, uh, it, and it's more like taffy or something. You pluck it down, and it stays down. So let's see if we can draw the string. There it is, okay. Uh, and sometimes you see some are worse than others and so on. And this is, this is his plucking model. He, he, he called it the plucking model. And it's my drawing, it's not Friedman's. He just talked his way through it. But if you read his uh, text, what you get is that the, the down pluck is the bust and the up pluck is the boom. And then he says, in the 93 edition, but not in the 63 edition. He says, those Austrians are just off base. They've got a boom bust theory, and they need a bust boom theory, all right? Well, you can see here they're misidentifying, Friedman's misidentifying the boom. That's a recovery, all right? It's a recovery. And he doesn't see the boom at all. The real boom comes before the bust, and he's got it concealed because he's plotting total outcome, uh, total output. If he plots the different stages of production, he'll see some are going up and some are going down, okay? And at an empirical level, uh, the, the net movement may be very little, and so it doesn't pass the Keynes test, all right? So he, he ignores what's going on before the bust, uh, but picks up the bust. Uh, and so this is this is his model. Let's see what I've got here. Oh yeah, there he is. I knew he was in there somewhere. Uh, I'll, I'll say before I go on that this was where Friedman and I had our correspondence on uh, uh, on the whole issues, and this is where he sent me the uh, 
the photocopy of the interest rate not changing during the 20s, which he considered uh, sort of a game changer in our debate, but really wasn't. Why was Friedman so unreceptive to the Austrian theory? Well, you got some idea already, but I can draw on my first lecture. I hope most of you were here to hear the first lecture on Keynes, or on uh, Knight and Clark. Uh, and it goes like this. See, we're still trying to explain that 30 month lag, 18 to 30 month lag. Um, Interest rates seem to be no part of the problem. And our question is what goes on in Friedman's mind during that short run, those critical 18 to 30 months. Well, guess what? He goes for the Clark Knight model. Uh, in looks like this. First, he talks about what happens when there's more money, and it doesn't come in through credit markets. Uh, it, it just gets in the hands of consumers, gets in the hands of people. This is where his helicopter thing comes in. You know, Helicopter flies over the landscape and drops money and is picked up by people, so they're the holders of cash. And so look what he, he says. He says, holders of cash, once the helicopter's out of the way, bid up the prices of assets. If the extra demand is initially directed at a particular class of assets, say government securities, or commercial paper, or the like, now see, he hasn't got the Fed buying those things, he's got these people who've already got the money from the helicopter. Uh, the result will be to pull the prices of such ass assets out of line with other assets, and thus widen the area into which extra cash spills. The increased demand will spread sooner or later, affecting equities, houses, durable producer goods, durable consumer goods, and so on. Though not necessarily in that order, these effects can be described as operating on interest rates. And he puts it in quotes, on interest rates, okay? If a more cosmopolitan, and I put in there, that is Austrian, interpretation of interest rates is adopted than the usual one, which refers to a small range of marketable securities. Well, the Austrians are not talking about a small range of market securities. They're talking about the general intertemporal terms of trade through financial sector. Now, here's where he brings in Knight and Clark. And I've drawn my model up there. And instead of calling it capital, I say sources, that's night. And instead of saying consumption, I say services, that's night. Sources yielding services. And if you didn't have that diagram up there to know what we're talking about, it'd make your head swim to read this next passage. But let's read it and see what he says. See if you can follow it. I'll see if I can follow it, okay? The key feature of this process during which interest rates are low is that it tends to raise the price of sources, that's interest-sensitive capital goods, of both producer and consumer services relative to the prices of the services themselves. It therefore encourages the production of such sources and at the same time, the direct acquisition of the services rather than of the sources. But these reactions, in their turn, tend to raise the price of the services relative to the price of the sources. That is, to undo the initial effects of the interest rate. The final result may be a rise in the expenditures in all directions without any change in interest rates at all. In other words, after you get the boom and the bus and everything clears, the interest rate might be the same. Interest rates and asset prices may simply be a conduit through which the effect of monetary change is transmitted to expenditures without being altered at all. Well, the reason they're not altered is because you have this timeless sources and services moving first up and first down, okay, and then down. And in the end, they had nothing to do with anything, all right? Uh, 
But how then does Friedman account for this lag? We're back to this lag. Because if that's what happened, and it happened in such a clean fashion that nothing really happened with real capital or whatever, then, then where's the lag? And Friedman has to thank hard for this, and he actually uh, wrote a whole article on the lag structure, and it finally, it finally came to him what it was that would account for the lag. And here it is. See if, see if it sounds familiar. Friedman accounts for the MP lag of 18 to 30 months. He says, well, you know, it may be that monetary expansion induces someone within two or three months to contemplate building a factory. Within four or five to draw up plans. Within six or seven to get construction started. The actual construction may take another six months. And much of the effect of the income stream may come still later insofar as initial goods used in the construction are withdrawn from inventories and only subsequently lead to an increased expenditure by suppliers. Has anyone ever heard a story like that before anywhere? <laughs> <laughs> That's the Austrian theory of the business cycle, for Christ's sakes. Okay? Now, what doesn't make sense, see, the, you know, this, this, this article is in that Optimum Quantity of Money and other essays, 1969 book, what doesn't make sense is that Friedman thinks that the, those Austrians are silly. They got all this capital stuff. We don't need it. Uh, and just, we just leave it alone. And the only time we need it, the only time we need it is bring it in to explain that lag. And then once we've got that lag explained, we get it out again. Right? Well, no, I'm sorry. It doesn't work that way. If this explains the lag, then this is the theory. Right? And all of the prattle about sources and services uh, goes away, right? Now, so what I'm suggesting here is that during that, all that planning, all those, that's when the economy is in the boom period, right? And then when it all comes to naught because of resource availability, then you get the downturn. And there's nothing uh, run of the mill about it, or there's, there's nothing um, garden variety about it is it's, it's the expression, it's the explanation of the downturn. Yeah, yeah, there's a secondary contraction. Hayek knew that. He wrote about it before Keynes ever wrote the general theory. Right? But those are complicating factors and no more. I've got a, a couple of minutes. I've got to show you one other thing. If it comes up next. I th oh, yeah, I think it will. <laughs> this, I can't help but tell this story. It won't take long. Uh, I was in Menlo Park, that's when the Institute for Humane Studies was there, right next door to Sanford, uh, Sanford University. And at Stanford, uh, Friedman was at the Hoover Institution. And uh, he parked there uh, close to the Hoover Tower. And I'd been told many times that his license plate was the equation of exchange. And I wondered, <laughs> is that really true? I mean. Vanity tags were in in California. You know, they didn't start in Alabama. They started in California, vanity tags. So when I went to the library a time or two or three or four, I always took my camera thinking eventually I'll find, I'll find it. Okay? And I looked and I looked and I didn't find it. I'm sorry. I didn't find it. But I photocopied uh, or, or, or I, I photoshopped a 1970 Cadillac. I know he drove a Cadillac. I don't think he drove one white, uh, a red with a white vinyl top, but he drove a Cadillac. And it had a California plate on it. And I did a little photoshopping, and we got MV equal PQ out of it, okay? So I could show it to my students or whatever. And then something appeared on the ManQ blog. Out of the blue, a student sent me this. It got around. And Mancu is asking, how can you identify my car? Does he have one of these tags? No, his is EC10. I wouldn't do that at all, Brent. I wouldn't put my course number or anything else on the tag. That's, that's it, OK? Well, there were some comments. Let's see if we can get some comments. So you know, I hate to spoil things. But I must say, I think Milton Friedman has a better plate. Okay. This is from an article I came across. He says, years ago, trying to find Friedman's 
apartment in San Francisco, I knew I was in the right location when I spotted a car with a license plate reading MV equal PT. Well, T is the Fisher, that's Irving Fisher's transactions version of the equation of exchange. So someone else writes in, says, Milton Friedman's license is MP equals PQ, not MV equals PT. Here's the picture. And it's a French side, it turns out. Are we on internet here or not? Let's see. Yeah. Well, that's France. And you scroll down. Yeah, I see down there it says La Vouture. Is that the way you pronounce that? Of Milton Friedman. So we finally get to see the real one. <laughs> they cribbed it from me, okay? <laughs> and the worst thing, the worst thing is on the same site you find, they complained that, that the equal sign had been dubbed in. They said, well, somebody's dubbed in the equal sign. I thought I did a pretty good job of it. In fact, better than Friedman, because eventually another student showed me a picture. Oh, this, this goes on. That's pretty ridiculous, he says. And then the next one. I love economists. Whoop, let me go back to that one. There's Friedman's real tag, and he's got a Y in there. That's, what does that mean? That's supposed to be income. That's nominal income, though. He, he would use a lowercase y to mean real income. I can just hear Friedman trying to get the Department of Motor Vehicles to give him a lowercase y there. You know? <laughs> they wouldn't do it. He could have put Q, MV equal PQ. That would have been fine with him. But I, I don't know. I assume that was already taken. Is that it? Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, that's true. So anyhow, in case you're doubt, that's the real picture, and mine is a phony one. Okay. Thank you much. Thank you.